Well, hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back to Voices in My Head, episode 25. And in this episode, we're talking with Stephen J. Cohen, and he is the guy who does narrating audiobooks from the public domain, and he sets them up for people. Public domain? Boy, that sounds royal or something. Is he a king? A king? Why would you think he's a king? Well, domain just sounds so kingy-ish and stuff. Well, I don't know. Maybe he is a king of some sort. We know that he narrates books from the public domain. Yeah, so he's like the king of audiobook narrating. He's royalty. Okay, yeah, you just think about that, and uh, maybe when we get to know him a little bit in the show, you uh, you can ask him that, if he's a king or something. Oh, good. Okay, I'll try to remember to ask him. Okay, on with the show then, right? Yeah, on with the show. Stephen Cohen and Basil. Okay. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, check it out. We've got Stephen J. Cohen on the air with us today. Hi, Basil. Coming to us live from Massachusetts, down there by the New York border. He's kind of like one of those borderlands guys, you know, (laughs) up there where the snow flies deeper than it does here in Alaska, apparently. Yeah. So so you guys got a lot of snow this year down in your part of the country, didn't you? Actually, it was last year. The weird thing is this year. Yeah, this year we're getting what you, you know, the whole snow is missing thing. Oh, yeah. you know, so for us, it's it's all about, you know, I'm I'm in the Berkshires, so it's all sort of maple syrup around here. Oh, ah, okay. And cool. we need a good snowpack in order for that sort of like days above freezing, night nights below freezing thing to make the maple syrup happen. Right. La- last year was, you know, had that really deep snowpack. Right now, they're all sugaring and they're really happy and hopefully... Hopefully they get to go for uh, for a long time because you know it's part of the reason to live here is definitely the maple syrup. Oh yeah, absolutely. I we, think we occasionally uh, do pull birch sap out of our mm-hmm. the trees in our yard and make birch syrup. But one thing that my son and I learned when doing that uh, maple syrup, it's like five thousand to one is the ratio. So you have five thousand ounces of of maple sap, you get one ounce of maple sugar. Mm-hmm. For birch syrup, it's one hundred thousand to one. <laughs> So we got uh, we we did maybe 150 some gallons of sap and got two quart jars of yeah not worth the effort so and it didn't taste as good as, as maple sugar anyway I'll bring some to I'll bring some to uh, APAC oh cool yeah that. if if they let me bring it on the airplane you know I'll bring the little, the little bottles oh there you go there yeah. you go yeah. yeah. Make sure you wrap him well. I brought I, I brought some custom Alaskan beers last year to APAC, uh, actually to give to my father, my stepdad in Ohio, when I was on my way home and uh, had him packed up in my bag. And uh, I was kind of nervous that one of them would break. I'd heard horror stories of getting your luggage and there's beer dripping through all your clothes. So, so pack yeah. him well. Anyway, you've got a pretty great venture going over there. You are doing, tell us about Listen to a Book. Where did this oh. come from? All right. So um, a lot of people in the, the audiobook narrating community will know Mike Vendetti. Mm-hmm. Um, Mike Vendetti, uh, back before ACX was a, you know, existed, um, the people would get an independent contract with Audible in order to publish audiobooks. Mm-hmm. And a few people, a few different people who you know who were around, um, have those contracts back in the day, and and Mike had his, and he decided instead of focusing on new books, he thought, well, there's all these things in the public domain, and he could set up a system for people to record classic audio, things that we didn't have to acquire the rights for, and then get them recorded. And Mike was getting ready to hang things up, and I approached him, and I told him how important it was and having been an English teacher at one point I'm like you you can't stop and he said you know what if you care this much about it would you like to come in and learn the business and help continue what we were doing and so that's what I did I I took over from Mike and um, I automated a lot of things that he was doing manually and we currently have over 1400 audiobooks in Mm -hmm. audible you know audible iTunes and Amazon um, 
and you know, and they're all things that would be in the public domain in the United States. So that's before 1923, or there are some things that fell into the public domain between um, 1923 and 1978. The U.S. has got some weird copyright laws, mm. but essentially that's what we did to sort of like grow this 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 base. And I mean, a great way to think of it, Basil. So if, let's say you wanted to record um, some Edgar Allan Poe. You know, I mean, I, I think you would do that really well. So, you know, if, if I came to you and said, you know, I would love to hear your telltale heart, you know, nice, not a long piece, just a short piece. Mm. The point is, Poe doesn't show up for his half of the royalties, right? Yeah, there you go. So, so you get both the, the share that would have gone to the narrator and the rights holders, since you're the only rights holder, since it's only the audio production that has rights. Mm. Um, the question people then typically ask is, well, then where do you guys make any money? Whereas the ACX deal has Audible keeping 60% and them passing on a 40% royalty, the contract we have, um, Audible keeps 50%. So we keep a 10% slice and pass on the same 40%. Hmm. So the money we're making is coming out of, I guess, Audible's pocket, not yours. Hmm. So we're able to match the ACX deal and do a value add on top of it. And so, yeah, we've been talking to different people who can't use ACX for some reason, like Canadian authors and Canadian narrators, or if somebody wants to do something that doesn't really fit, like they want to do a royalty share with a dual narrator, and ACX doesn't have a mechanism to pay two narrators on one job, I can set up our system to handle um, a split of royalties that's not a 50-50 split, so whatever you were all to come up with. So that's what it's been and what it is that we're we're working on growing. Well, that's excellent. Now. You guys, um, so you got, did you get grandfathered in to that, to that deal that Mike had or? Yeah. So or you basically just kind of picked it up and carried it on. Right. I'm, I'm working. So, you know, it's, it still is Mike's and, um, I'm working with him on this and we're working on, we're talking to some lawyers pro bono mm -hmm. about the right way to structure things and how do we make it a freestanding entity. And so, I mean, that's the interesting part to learn from this end of it, because when, when you've only sort of done this kind of freelance work, it's, it's different when you have to sit down and talk to people about what's a corporation and what's an LLC. Hey. I mean, that's a hey. level of things that I never really had to figure out before. Right. Oh, that's that's pretty cool. And I've noticed that AC or uh, Audible, as far as I could tell, doesn't do deals like this anymore. Because right. last time I looked it up, because I've got a my my company, Sandman Productions, is going out and uh, branching out to do Alaska specific books and authors. And uh, I looked up for a deal like that, and it's not there. They just push you right into ACX. Right. So so you got a you got a good deal. And yeah. a deal for the narrators out there as well. They don't have to split as much of the work. Right. I mean, we've been able to do some really interesting things of recent. So as an example, so, you know, Jeffrey Kafer talks about what he, you know, he set up what we're all referring to as a hybrid deal, something where there's a per finished hour up front and a royalty share on the other end. Right, right. Um, so I've been able to formalize that. And so I, I um, so a couple, uh, uh, an author came to me um, who thought ACX was a little bit too DIY, a little bit too do-it-yourself. And I said, well, I can do project management. And of course, my fee is coming out of Audible's end of things. But when I negotiated, what I did was I went through with her what, um, what union rates are in the United States, the whole, you know, at least 335 per finished hour. And I went through all the details, but instead of signing a contract to do the book there, what what we did was we essentially formalized in a contract a, a hybrid deal where there's a reduced per finish hour up front and a percentage on the back end. Because it's always seemed strange to me that if you were to go into a studio and cut a commercial, you would get your day rate for going into the studio that day and you'd get residuals. Mm. You know, but audiobooks, it's always been you get your day rate and nothing or with royalty wow. share, you get nothing up front and you're you're banking on this thing doing well. Right. I really feel like the default should be some sort of day rate and right, right. money on the other end. And it's just a question of trying to work that out. And hopefully later this year, um, you know, I can do something a little bit more formal that way or maybe we can do 
some more books exactly in this way. But th mm. that's been the that's the thing. You know, I'm not Random House or 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 Macmillan or anything like that. So without that kind of funding behind you, it's a question: of How do you try to do these kinds of projects that you think are important without having the bankroll, and trying to do something that's fair to everyone? That's that same dilemma that all small business owners run into is, you know, yeah. you got the dream, you got the image of what you want, but you don't have the dinero to do it. Right. So, exactly. Well, it sounds like you're, you're cranking right along. Now you guys focus primarily on the, um, uh, the public domain titles. Right. Well, at the moment, and, and that's the bulk of things. And, um, so we're looking at different ways of expanding beyond there, but right. So right now, as an example, um, you know, we, we all hit highs and lows. We, we have our queue empty out and our queue fill up. Mm. Well, if there was a public domain title you wanted to do, you know, if you wanted to do a Jack London title or, or whatever, whatever really, you know, something that really spoke to you as an actor, mm -hmm. um, the nice thing is you can put this in between to fill those gaps in order to, you know, like level things out. So there are days that you're doing your per finished hour work or right. your work for ACX or, or doing commercial auditions, but also you, you can do this and then you're getting, yeah, I guess twice the royalty share on the other end compared to a new book. But, and that's been great for the actor. It, mm -hmm. the, the point is how do you expand beyond that? So we're looking into a couple of different things like, um, approaching some author estates whose works will fall into the public domain in the next few years mm -hmm. to try to pick up American rights because in a lot of cases those families know that in other countries that aren't the United States their work is already in the public domain mm -hmm. and so it, it could potentially be a little cheaper in order to you know to get permission to do one of those titles because mm. all I'd need to do is pursue rights in the US as opposed to global rights right so what are the uh, what what's the difference between the the global uh, public domain rules oh. versus ours all right so the united states has changed its rules more times than than you would you could imagine we used to we started off with a really simple system that was 12 years and then they had something longer than that that you had to renew and essentially the bulk of the world is either life of the author plus 50 or life of the author plus 70. there are a couple of countries that are even longer than that but um they don't but audible and itunes don't have a front-end store in those countries mm. so it doesn't affect our sales right. what we have here is um, sometimes it's referred to as Disney-based legislation because a lot of Disney lobbying went into making it happen, mm. or Sonny Bono's name gets brought up because he was the person who pushed it in the Congress. Um, but essentially, if it's before 1923, it's in the public domain. If it's from 1923 to 1978, it's date of publication plus 95 years. Oh, wow. From 1978 onward, it's life of the author plus 70. Mm. So if you if you look at that, that'll mean that in 2018, I think, try and do quick math, things will start to fall into the public domain again. The United States is one of the few countries in the world where over the last series of years, nothing has been added to the public domain. Um, if we were in Canada, if you were just trying to do things in Canada, you could even do like the first few James Bond novels from the fifties. Yeah, exactly. Oh. Because because they are life plus they're a life plus fifty country. Oh, okay, okay. Or all of Agatha Christie is in the public domain. Where here in the United States, only two Agatha Christie titles are in the public. Interesting, domain. interesting. Yeah. You know, a few uh, well, about two years ago, I ran into. I was looking through public domain titles just to see what was there, and ran across a. Um, uh, oh shoot! I'm going to have to edit this long. Hazel got stupid part out of the <laughs> thing. Uh, the author of Slaughterhouse Five, or uh, Vonnegut. Vonnegut. Kurt Vonnegut. Thank you. Uh, okay. Found one of his titles there. Okay. From a magazine article, right. apparently, and it wasn't within that. Correct. Rules, but it was on Gutenberg. Right. And now, I, yeah. Yeah. And so, yeah. So I did here's. It. Here's how things like that happened. 
when I mentioned that there was a point in time that things needed to be renewed, two different things happened. One thing during that time period was anyone who was called before the House on American Activities Committee, the McCarthy hearings, one of the penalties for being called in front of the committee was you were not allowed to make money through royalties. Ah. Now, they knew they were going after Hollywood, and the bulk of people who they were going after in Hollywood had an incredible amount of income they were making that way. The, you know, a good sizable chunk of what they considered their annual income was coming through royalties. So this was specifically something that affected them. Um, and if you think about it, let's say you had something that wasn't doing all that well. Was it really worth the effort to go through filing the paperwork? You're only making a few dollars a year on this title. Right. You didn't bother. So that's one thing that happened with some authors. Other authors, including Vonnegut, uh, Philip K. Dick, uh, Marion Zimmer Bradley, um, a lot of them did uh, short stories for magazines, and they did those as works for hire which means they were paid by the word, they didn't own, own the, the rights to that particular story anymore. And then that magazine was not bought by some other magazine, it simply went out of business. Mm. So the copyright was never renewed, and there's all these little short stories. And, um, you know, and so we've actually been able to, when people come to us and saying, hey, I want to try this on something shorter, if I listen to them and think, oh, you've got a really good voice for sci-fi, I'll direct them towards one of those things. And actually, the Philip K. Dick mm -hmm. this year has done really well because of The Man in the High Castle right, right, right. Being, being released on Amazon. A lot of people said, wow, that was good. What else did he do? And all of our stories by Philip K. Dick have definitely shot up compared to previous years. Mm. Well, that's that's pretty interesting to know. You know, I yeah. and uh, I ended up doing the book. I, I rewrote it or changed it a little bit to update some of the language and references. And uh, no lawyers came and kicked down my door, so I figured, okay, it must be all right. Maybe. Yeah. Or they'll yeah. be assaulting through my ceiling here any minute, one or the other. <laughs> Well, speaking of, of changing something to make it work, Mike Dennis, who did that wonderful um, noir, oh, he did this wonderful, no yes, thank you, you saved me from having one of those moments of forgetting, <laughs> but he, he wanted to do some a public domain piece, and I went looking around, and I said, I found one that actually hasn't been done on Audible, ah. How, how'd you feel about doing Boston Blackie? Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, exactly. So sort of like one of the real originals of that kind of genre. And one of the things he had to do as he was going through it was when he was prepping, he said, you know, some of this slang actually has very different meanings today. So it wasn't just updating it so it would be understood. It was updating it because if he would have said that, a modern audience would have thought something completely different. Oh, that makes sense. That makes yeah, sense. exactly. I mean, you'll find those memes on the internet all the time. They show you like superheroes from 40 years ago saying something. You know, yeah, you wouldn't be saying it that way today. Yeah, yeah you'd get yeah, shot by someone for using that particular phrase. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So, yeah, Mike went through and found a couple of things that need to be changed. But aside from that, you know, did it as was right there on the page and um, – the the ebook had been for sale previously in in um, Amazon, but there but what they had connected it to for WhisperSync was some of the uh, Boston Blackie uh, radio shows from the 40s, uh -huh. not the original novel. So when Mike did it, that immediately got connected. Oh, cool. Uh, yeah, yeah. That's cool. Now, say an author wants, or a or a narrator or an author wants to have okay. their work done through you guys. For instance, okay. uh, right now, kind of as a side hobby, as you know, I'm a, I'm a writer as well as a narrator. And uh, I've picked up one of my favorite stories, uh, the uh, Ivanhoe, mm -hmm. back in the late 18, or early 1800s, late 1700s. And I'm rewriting it into modern language, translating it. I, I would have sworn it would have been out there, but I found out that it's neither in audiobooks mm -hmm. And there's not a current translation in ebook either. So I'm rewriting the whole book. Nice. I want to do it as an audio book. Now, I'm going to narrate it myself, obviously. Right. How would I approach you to pick something like this up? Because this is, well, it's on a public domain or it's in the public right. domain, but this is a whole new work as well. Exactly. And so I like to be as honest and straightforward with someone as possible. So the first thing I would say to you, knowing that you are technically within the United States, is Basil 
you're going to get exactly the same percentage working with me as you would if you did it yourself. I like to make that part clear up front with people like you who have that technical expertise and can do the whole thing yourself. Because I know you've put together eBooks and you've done this whole thing. If, so let's change just a little bit of your reality for a moment. Let's move you from Alaska to Canada. Suddenly in Canada, you don't have access to using ACX. Mm. You know, as a Canadian author, if you were doing this and you wanted to push it into the system, you couldn't use ACX. So somehow you find out what I do or somebody tells me to contact you because they know you're trying to do this and can't use ACX. Then I can go through the basics and say, if you'd like to do the whole thing yourself, I can match what ACX does for you. The main difference would be twofold. One, ACX pays you monthly um, and with small with people who have publishing contracts like us we get paid quarterly so that's a difference and we don't have the dashboard because mm. we only get sales data every time we get money ah, so see. so right so I, you can't go in every morning and see that dashboard mm. so for the canadian person who doesn't have access to the system there's a definite value there because otherwise they can't do that project mm. now Let's say you weren't as technically capable as you are. Let's say you went over to ACX and you were listening to people and you thought, wow, everybody sounds good. I can't tell the difference between somebody who can just give me a good audition versus somebody who's going to do a good product. You know, And I've actually had a few authors saying, I know how to write a story. I don't know how to assess this other end of the business. Mm. For that person, um, what I can explain is, I know people like Basil Sands. I know people, you know, like, um, you know, Amanda Rose Smith. Yeah, you know, I, I know these people and I can bring them, I can show them your project and help assemble a team for you. Mm. And I remind that person that, again, I'm making my money out of the other end of the deal. So essentially, I'm a free, free to you value add. Oh, nice. And I help assemble that team and get it done. And those are the only real limitations. Mm. That. Is that your neighbors out there? Um, I think I'm getting a phone call, but we can let the phone call go. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sounded like a little car horn out in the distance from this end. So, oh. well, that's cool. So, well, that sounds like a pretty good deal then. So someone could come yeah. out. You guys do non-public domain. Would you do original works as well? Yeah, exactly. In fact, some of the things that we've been doing recently have been exactly that. They've been, um, they're things that, that you would, they're self-published works. I mean, I know we don't use this term anymore, but this term, you know, before it was called self-publishing or indie publishing, it was called a vanity press. Right, right. And, and, and there's a negative connotation with that, so I know why people avoid that. But people who know the concept, it's safer to explain that way. Essentially, the service we're providing is equivalent to a vanity press. Mm. We provide you the access to the means of production and simplify things as much as possible. That's what all indie publishing really is. Right. We're trying to evolve a concept that's more of a cooperative model. And that's really the, the point where when you come to when somebody comes to me and then I, I, I listen to the story and I think that would be a really good match for Basil. I wonder if he's available. And what I'll do is I'll try to find two or three people who I think are a good match for the story, see mm -hmm. if they're available, talk to them about what their rates would be and then i like to present just like you would if you were doing an ad campaign here's three different narrators here's their availability here's their rates who do you like hmm. you know and see if i can help make that happen so i've i've been able to help people negotiate according to them afterward deals that were better than they'd negotiated on their own um i think because it's a little less scary when you're negotiating for someone else because I don't, you know, right. That might be why, I, you know, me walking in and saying, I want X per finished hour is a little bit different than me saying, look, if union rates are this, you, you know, where can we go with this guy? You know, what are your, and then helping and doing, right. doing that little bit of back right. and forth discussion and negotiation. So everybody feels they're getting a fair deal at the end. Mm. Well, that's yeah. cool. So, um, I had another question right on the tip of my tongue there for a second. And then apparently it <laughs> fell off and it's somewhere under my gums here. Let me see if I can find oh. it. Um, see, I know you brought up Ivanhoe. You, I personally right. think I would, I would love to hear your Sleepy Hollow. Ooh, 
That'd be a lot of fun. See, yeah, this is what I like to do with, yeah, when you have time, Basil, especially mm -hmm. if you want to release it before Halloween this year, right. I would love to have Basil Sands' The Legend of Sleepy Hollow go, because I, I really, I could hear, I could hear just how rich that would come out at the end. Well, we'll definitely, we'll definitely consider that. Okay. That's a, uh, yeah. I know I, I'm, I'm booked up, up to APAC. And then I think I got one title right after that that I would get called for a series that I do. But then, see, usually I take most of the summer off except for one title that I do every year. And uh, then I'm kind of open coming back in. Mm -hmm. So, hey, we might be able to do something on that. Now, how do you um, – th there's a lot of titles. Like I imagine Sleepy Hollow may be on Audible already. Yes. Maybe even up there 15 or 20 times by yes. narrators. How do you deal with that? And how does how does sales happen with a... All right. Like so that? when something is in the public... Well, first thing is, um, if I speak to you as another actor, so just because Macbeth has been performed already, we shouldn't stage Macbeth again. You know, I, I think if, if you were to stage a new production of a classic, mm -hmm. you're doing so because you think there's something that's uniquely you you can bring to that classic, whether it's Macbeth, King Lear, or The Legend of Sleepy Hollow. Uh -huh. you know, it doesn't really matter. There's something that would be unique about your interpretation. And if we so if we think about it in, in terms of stage plays, we're not scared of the fact that there are other versions out there. Right. And here's what I think I've been seeing as I've been looking online two things. People tend to judge books by their cover, especially when it's in the public domain and they can have one of 20 different versions that are out there. Right. They, they do read reviews, but they also really pay attention to um, the audio sample and they think, who can I spend the next 10 hours listening to? And, you know, there's a lot of amazing narrators and there's a lot of celebrity narrators. And, but, you know, when you sit down and listen and you think, you know, that's the voice for me for The Wizard of Oz. That's the voice for me for Washington Irving. That's the voice for me for right. for Mark Twain. That's what's going on. You know, it's somebody deciding that they're going to choose you to tell them the story. And yet, mm -hmm. if Elijah Wood recorded Huckleberry Finn and Johnny Heller recorded Huckleberry Finn, and you go and you listen to the samples... You know, the two of them sound incredibly different, and they have really oh. different takes on the same story. You right. know, so what do you, you choose? Right. That makes sense. That makes yeah. perfect sense. And, yeah, the difference between two narrators can really be make or break the story for some people. Yeah. One other thing that will tend to affect things is if a story hasn't been done in the last 10, 12 years, Audiobooks have really, really changed. If you go back and listen to a book recorded in the late 90s, there's a very different reading style mm. that's that's there. Right. Uh, and, and with some narrators, it really persisted into the early 2000s. So if you're looking for a title to do and it hasn't been done in the last 10 years, really listen to that sample. I think you'll find that there's a different kind of acting being done. Mm. Um, and it's hard to put a word on, on what's different about it, but you'll know it when you hear it. Oh, yeah. I've been listening to audiobooks for a long, long time. And recently, I listened to one of my favorites. Frederick Forsyth is one of my favorite mm -hmm. authors. And I, I love a lot of his books. And I, I had listened to The Day of the Jackal uh, from a production. I think it was done in like 2006, 2008. And it was, it was good. It was really good. Then I found a copy of the original from 1973 that was done on cassettes. And mm -hmm. uh, this would have been like a uh, the Royal Institute for the Blind kind of deal back in the 70s. Right. Um, and the read was so significantly different. I mean, the modern guy was an actor who acted it. The original guy was a reader who read mm -hmm. it, like your stuffy professor uncle sat by your bed and read you the story of the day of the jackal. And he read the <laughs> book as if it was a book and you could actually hear the people in the cubicle next to him reading a different book the entire time. It's like, whoa, completely yeah. different. Hard to get in. Once I got into the story, it was good. Right. And uh, But yeah, completely different style uh, from one decade to the next. Right, exactly. You know, I'm often put in the mind of the really fun part of the, um, of the Princess Bride movie where they would jump back out with, you know, Falk going, 
he's okay, you know. He he doesn't get, you know, the whole thing where he jumps out of the right, story, right, you right, know, that right, moment. Right. Because, you know, he's reading the story. I mean, that's the great conceit of that movie mm-hmm. is that is that that's an audio book, really. He's reading his grandson a story and he's reading it well enough that his grandson sees the story and experiences the story. And by the end, doesn't really mind that it's a kissing book. Right. You know? Right. Right. You, you know, know? It's, it's like a, a listener of mine from the UK once told me that, uh, said, yeah, I was sitting on the on the subway and I'm driving to or going to work, listening to uh, this book. And it was like a movie in my head. I mm-hmm. was seeing the whole thing happen in front of me. And he was actually interacting with the book. There was a fighter, a jet fighter scene where the planes are all swirling around. Mm-hmm. He said people started staring at him and he realized he had been moving with the story as it was, you know, the, the plane banked to the right and he was moving his body here on the public transportation. And people were like, what's up with this guy? <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, if it's, if, it's, if it's done right, yeah, it becomes a movie in your head. Yeah. That's pretty cool. Yeah. So you guys have had, you said, 1,400 titles. Yeah. Now, that's, that's significant. It what, is. What period of time has that occurred? Well, okay, so Mike started doing this in 2010, I think. I think it's May, of, sometime in 2010. I may be wrong. I'd have to double check. Um, but what we found was after I automated things, when I started working with him, the amount of books we were able to move through the system increased because you know all the manual reconciliation of this title to this net so you know having spent some time writing computer code i was able to work with the narrators ask them you know what worked for them because you know we're creative types and we don't like all the systems that people try to make us use right right you know and so i tried using some very free form systems to see what narrators didn't mind using and I got some great feedback. You know, if you tell a group of, of narrators, tell me what you don't like about this and tell me what you do, you will get feedback. And I got a, an incredible amount of feedback about what the initial systems we were using, what they liked, what they didn't like. And I, I built something completely from scratch mm. that was as tailored as I could to what they said they liked. Mm. And once I got that done, you can go from making the proposal and then I just double check to make sure if you're saying the proposal's in the public domain, I double check to make sure it is, and then I approve it. Then you move through the project, and all you have to do is mark off, are you in pre-production, are you in post-production, where are you, or are you ready to upload? Mm. Uh, you then fill out a form that just explains a couple of other things about it. After you've got the book mastered, if you're, self, if you're doing it yourself instead of sending it out to an engineer, uh, I ask that you run a piece of software I wrote called Second Opinion that just sort of double checks the mastering. It doesn't, it does some minor repairs, mm. but it will, you know, like if everything else is okay, but your peaks are slightly above negative three, it'll bring them all back down to negative three, mm. things like that. It'll make small fixes. It'll trim the ends of your file, but it basically says yes or no, you know, is this audio ready to go? And then you upload it to the system. And then from all the data that's been put in since you first proposed, I have all the data that Audible asks for me on my end. And since I know that you've both done a a QC check and Second Opinion has done its sort of simplified QC check, when I actually listen, and I do, and people wonder how I can listen. You listen listen to the whole book? I don't listen. So... What what usually happen is this: either I'm spot checking if I've gotten no advice at that point, and I'm I'm picking a few places to see if it feels consistent. Mm. Um, I'm picking a few places, you know, around. Or if I've if I've spoken to you during the production, and and you say something like, you know, the hardest part for me to do was was right when he had to tell his mother. It was just I was really fine up until then, and then I found my myself later but i'm not really sure if somebody tells me that then i'll go find that chapter and i'll make sure that i'm listening to that particular transition otherwise really what i'm doing is i'm spot checking but i'm not spot checking for audio quality i get to spot check and then come back to an actor and say you know that was a great performance based upon what i heard or how are you feeling the day that you recorded chapter seven you know and someone like says, a director just, or director, a di- well, I, directorial. Right. I can. Well, I can. I can ask the question, and I've had somebody say, "Well, you know, I really wasn't feeling that well." I said, "Can you double check and see if you're happy 
with it because I noticed a real difference in energy between chapter six and and seven, things really changed. And I wanna make sure this is how you want the book to be. So I'm not putting my directorial idea as much as I'm trying to be that audience, that first audience member, so that you then get some feedback. It's been very rare when I've done that. Right. Um, but actually when I have done that, it, it sometimes turns out the person had a cold or mm. they had to have broken down their studio and rebuilt it and they didn't put things back together quite right and they weren't really certain that day. you know. Or right. I've actually had people come back and say, yeah, I, I re-listened and, and I like the way it goes. So if you're okay, then push it forward. And I have. Mm. Okay. So it's really me just being another set of ears at that point as right. opposed to imposing a, a definite yes or no. Now, with that concept of of being a director slash producer and, and all this other stuff, what is your background prior to listen to a book? Okay. So I started off, I was born and raised in New York, and I studied theater at Brooklyn College and NYU. Mm. Um, and so I actually put myself through grad school doing lighting and sound on Theater Row. Mm. Uh, and eventually went from there to teaching because sometimes it's hard to find tech work when you're not a member of the union yet or, you know, I was a member of, of, of equity. I was an, an equity stage manager at one point, um, but I was never a member of IA. So I was, mm. so the tech work I was doing was mostly non, non-union. Um, I did some, some work at Symphony Space. Uh, so, which is where Selected Shorts comes out of, and I, and I worked on things like Bloomsday on Broadway there, and did some pieces with them back in the day, and went from there. I, I taught for a number of years in New York before I moved up here to Massachusetts. Taught when I was up here in, in Massachusetts, um, then spent some time as a programmer. Uh, so mm. It was sort of a, an out of the blue life switch for a number of years. Um, I'm 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 a trained sound guy and I'm a trained actor. I'm not a trained um, programmer, but I got to act the part of a programmer for, for a good number of years. Huh. And um, I mean, I got my first computer with my bar mitzvah money when I was 13. And I've been playing with technology ever since. And so I'm techno now, now technology ask, wise, self-taught. What, what kind of computer was it you got at age 13? At 13, it was a Commodore 64. Ah, see, this puts you in a certain generation. <laughs> Would you believe 20 feet from me, I have a Commodore 64 sitting on a shelf. Because it's you, I absolutely do believe that. <laughs> if you would believe that I have a Commodore 64 emulator on my Android phone. Oh, wow. Along with um, an old school Mac emulator on that phone, for exactly that reason. There are some things that are just kind of fun to do on old, yeah. on old bits of computers. Oh, cool. But, <laughs> but yeah, so that was where I started, and I just messed with technology the whole way through. It was just always mm. fun, and you know, doing lighting and sound was really the most official technology pieces that I was doing. Mm. And so, probably about the time that you were doing patio books, I was actually over on places like Odesk, um, picking up sound engineering work on the side, mm. while I was, um, you know, while I was doing software programming during the day. So I was doing some oh. VO work, and I was mastering, um, you know, mastering uh, podcasts for people, um, right. uh, an, an English language learning podcast back then, and. And she liked the fact that I was also a classroom teacher, so I was able to double check what she had done and made sure it made sense. Mm. And I was mastering it so that way it could be as compressed as possible, but still be understandable. Right, right. So I was doing things like that. And um, then a few people who I was engineering for all said to me, it used to be fun to act with you on stage. We're doing this audiobook stuff. How about getting back on this side of the mic? Oh, nice. And um, yeah, it wasn't long after that that um, I wound up recording my demo with John with Johnny Heller, mm. and uh, pushed through and did some books on ACX and kind of the rest of the stuff you know because it's kind of just rolled on since then. I think already knowing some people and already understanding how things worked, ACX sort of offered me the ability to prove to myself that I still understood what needed to happen. And, right. and no, it's like when, when I set up this booth, um, I contacted George Whittem. And the first thing I said was, 
hi, I'm a trained sound engineer, but I'm used to doing sound in a theater. And so it's like, oh, so you have no idea how sound bounces when the wall is six feet away or not even six feet, you know? Right, right. It's it's one meter back this way. And, and you know, it's not even, I mean, the booth is small. Right. But yeah, I don't understand really how things bounce in here. or I didn't at that point. And I've learned, you know, if you give me a, a theater that sees 300, yeah, I can mm -hmm. balance that without thinking about it. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so it became a whole different conversation when I was talking with George because we were able to, like, you know, trade stories, and he was able to say, oh, well, you usually think this way, but now you have to kind of turn that around because, and then he would bring up something I would never thought of because, mm -hmm. of course, this is what he's done the entire time through. He knows these right. little spaces, and, you know, I, I mean, I wasn't balancing things in arenas. I was balancing things in, like, the Houseman Theater, you know, large old proscenium theaters. Right, right different animal oh yeah it, it is very different and what what advice would you give to someone who came up through the stage productions and is stepping into audiobooks it's more similar than it's different um it audiobooks from what i'm seeing because of course you know i i've i've tried other parts of vo and what they do and how and how they are for me Audiobooks feels like it's the thing that's closest akin in the United States, at least, to mm. stage work. It's portraying one or more characters, depending upon if you're first or third person, one or more characters for a prolonged time. You're doing the same sort of research that you were doing to really make your stage characters credible. Um, I've used more Meisner technique to, you know, for these characters than I have anything else. You know, I could. I think you can almost make the argument that without knowing it, Sanford Meisner really wrote a very well-constructed method for approaching an audio book. Huh. Um, and um, I'll have to read his stuff. Oh yeah, and you can actually find some videos uh, of him teaching. And really, his thing was, um, it's about you having a genuine reaction in the moment. So he wasn't he wasn't sort of like the sense memory, bring yourself back and make yourself cry, as much as he wanted the genuine reaction you had in your body in that moment to what had just happened. Mm. Now the interesting thing is, I mean, I've prepped a text. And thought I was going to feel one way. And then instead of feeling really sad, I realized there was an underlying anger that I hadn't really seen when I was prepping oh. the text. Realizing, okay, that's going to be a really different read. And then I'll step out of the booth and get some water, think about it, and come back in and, 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 and try to work on it from there. Right. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, I'll definitely have to give him a read. I've never had any formal training in this business. It just kind of comes to me but I, then I hear people like yourself that have been formally trained it's like oh I don't know those references hmm so. it's interesting I mean when I hear you when I hear you read I mean I I, I, um, I have in my queue and have not listened to some of the Piers Anthony that you, you mm. did and I'm, I'm I haven't gotten to them yet when I've heard you read in the past you know there's a real I enjoy being read to by you because I feel the joy of reading. Mm. Does that make sense? I think so. Yeah. You know, it's it's like it it's Basil. It's like having your favorite uncle read you a book. <laughs> you know what I mean? You know, like it's going to be fun. He's going he's going to find highs and lows. This is going to be great, and you want to settle in with that cup of cocoa and listen. Mm. That you know, that's sort of that's the feeling. You know, regardless of where the text is. And, yeah, I'm looking forward to listening to some Piers Anthony. Soon. I'm flattered. I'm flattered. Yeah, yeah those Piers Anthonys, that, that was a, a whole string of his books from his early career that was like, wow. You could, you could see the progression of the writer as mm -hmm. he goes along. Just an advisory on a, a couple of the books in the uh, Autobiography of a Space Tyrant series. Um, you know, just be aware. A couple of them are kind of, as one reviewer said, rapey so yeah yeah it was a shock to my system part way through mm -hmm. the book and i was like oh and and here this is an interesting thing and i'll, I'll bring this up to you as an actor when you okay. get into the mind of the author or, or at least of the character like mm -hmm. for instance the uh the the space tyrant series that i read there was six books in that series i think um but they're all first person 
and they're all about 12, 13 hours long, so pretty long books for a novel. And after six straight weeks of being inside this guy's head, mm -hmm. it was you, you begin to identify not just with the character, but almost as the character. So you that is your stage acting experience. I mean, that's that's the thing. When you're doing the same role night after night, mm -hmm. regardless of if you're the lead or if you're doing a small part, that doesn't really matter at that point. If I'm doing a six week run, a six month run of something, it's if, if it's two weeks open and closed, it's completely different. Mm -hmm. But if it's a significant part of my day and I know I have to re-enter that character and I'm going to go through that again, you know, there is, and, you know, that's why I like that Meisner way of doing things instead of the, you know, I'm going to immerse myself so much that I become the character because right. his point of view really wasn't that. And people often focus on the basic Meisner exercise where they're doing the repetition thing. I know some of the people watching will know what I'm talking about. That's not the goal. That's just an exercise to get you to the goal. The goal is you, Basil, and I are having a conversation now, and we're going back and forth, and I will say something in character. I don't want the reaction you think the character is supposed to have. I want your genuine emotional reaction as if you were in that moment. And what you were just talking about of being in that character for the 13-hour book and then doing the next 13-hour book, that's it. You're there. You're allowing that character's emotionality and response and world to come out through the filter of Basil Sands, which is mm. why it's different if you do it than if somebody else does the same right. book. Right. So th that kind of like goes back to the other point. Why do a book that's been done already? Yes, there's there there are a number of Sleepy Hollows out there, but none of them have been filtered through Basil. Right, right. It'll be a different different animal. We do this, we talk about the same thing with writing. Someone says, well, you know, there's only so many stories that you can actually tell. And I think I, on a podcast or a blog that I had read recently, someone said mm -hmm. there's actually only six or seven stories that exist in the world. Right. But they're all told a little differently by each writer. And it, it's going to be filtered through that person's thinking, that person's understanding, that person's vocal range and so on. And so, yeah, it becomes a totally different animal, hence tens of millions of different novels all telling the same six stories. Exactly. From a totally different perspective. Exactly. So, very cool. Now, do you still narrate audiobooks as well? Yes, I do. Uh, in fact, I've got a pretty full queue at the moment. Uh, I'm trying to finish up a, a project that's a little overdue. And then I have a really interesting project that started off as um, as a graphic novel that got turned into a novel, and now I'm going to be working on the audiobook version. Oh, wow. uh, the, the, yeah, if any, you can look up online a, a wonderful artist um, named Duncan Eagleson, um, and Duncan has a character he's been living with for a long time called Railwalker, um, and. He does some wonderful, wonderful stuff. Um, and Railwalker sort of tales of the urban shaman, you know, so mm. he, he's kind of worked with this material for a long time. And then eventually it wound up being novel length. Um, some people may know that name from a couple of interesting places. It's associated with some of the early Sandman uh -huh. pieces. It's also, he was thanked, I think, by Marion Zimmer Bradley for in the beginning of one of the Mists of Avalon books because he's also um, he's a, um, a stage fighting sword play. Um, he, he's an authority. He, he knows his stuff. Mm. Um, and so I, 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 I was able to, to get to do this and that's coming down and then hopefully from there maybe a few shorter pieces because these these are kind of big and, and weighty. I think I'd like right. to spend some time with maybe some Arthur C. Clarke something. There you go something speculative and fun. Well, know? I'm look I'm looking at the Duncan Eagleson's yeah. webpage here and yeah, those look like some pretty heavy duty graphic novels. Yeah. Yeah. He he's a really interesting person. <laughs> wow, interesting. Yeah. Yeah, and then like you said, sometimes you want to take a break from the heavy duty stuff and just do something light and fun. Yeah, and light and fun is different for different people. I mean, I love a good mystery, and I love, I say speculative fiction instead of sci-fi, because for me, 
that's what makes science fiction fun. I could care less whether the, you know, it's not about the science being sound and it's not about a fantasy world. It's about what are you making me think about? You know, I would rather read The Lathe of Heaven than watch a full on fantasy mm. because I, I, you know, the nature of reality is a fun thing to, to consider. Right. You know, very cool. Very cool. Like, on on that front, I can't wait to hear the full cast thing that Scott Brick is working on with City on the Edge of Forever. Mm. Uh, the original Harlan Ellison script, which goes very, very far beyond what they did in the Star Trek episode that most people remember with Joan Collins. Uh-huh. So um, it, it's a wonderful project. And I mean, the, part of the reason I bring that up is you were asking me what else was I doing and I didn't really get around to this. Um, Chris Barnes, who I know you've had on probably before this will air, mm -hmm. uh, Chris Barnes and I met doing online audio drama. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, at, so, and there's a whole bunch of some, some sort of fan fiction and some original fiction you can find out there. Here in the United States, it's, it's a very small thing. In the UK, it, it's never gone out of production. So, mm. BBC's Radio 4 still to this day has first run sitcoms and dramas and mysteries oh, yeah. and love stories that are all produced for radio. We sort of fell out of the pattern of mm -hmm. doing that when TV sort of took off and radio right. found it was more monetarily um, it was more monetarily successful to do songs than to do stories if television was going to do stories. Right, right. Yeah. Um, I, I, the reason I, I yeah reason I bring that up is I don't some of your some of the people <clears throat> watching may remember about a year ago uh, there was an announcement at Audible they were starting a new department <clears throat> mm. and they hired all these people some from NPR and from other places and that department that department was tasked with helping on Audible become the HBO of audio mm. And that was all they said about it. And I was thinking, well, what does that mean? Well, it's right. got to mean original content. And if you have original content that's going straight to audio, mm. not as a book, aren't we talking about some form of radio play? Yeah, yeah. You know? Absolutely. So, and w between that and the Jeffrey Deavers piece that was full cast they did a couple of years back, I think they're testing the waters here. And that is a different direction I would like to see listen to a book able to move toward. Mm -hmm. I, I would, you know, because I can be flexible, I would like to see if I can work with some of these groups that are putting together some of these audio dramas and just make sure all the legalities are taken care of and all the rights have right. been paid. And, you know, as long as we can produce it to the same quality as an audio book, Audible is perfectly happy to have me publish it oh, yeah. into the system. So, you know, I'd like to be part of helping that come back here because I love those stories. I love that. In fact, Radio 4 is a regular thing that's on here, even though I'm in the U.S., mm. uh, because I, I want to listen to stories. Sometimes it's wonderful to have one person read you a story. Sometimes it's wonderful for a full cast right. to come in and do it for you. Now, when you're talking these similar to like the Radio 4 stuff, yep. you're you're talking not just the actors, but full on sound effects and yeah, that, yeah. And that's the real divisive thing. I mean, you'll see if you look up that Jeffrey Deavers, and I can't remember the name of it, but the Jeffrey Deavers piece that was a full cast uh -huh. thing that was released uh, maybe two years ago now, probably not quite that much. Mm. If you read through the comments, you'll see almost an equal number of people loving it and people going, what, were, what was with all the sound effects? Right. You know, complaining. It's an, you know, and then, it was fun because you could actually watch the comment stream as people were explaining, you know, there were no he said and she said. There were no, so you needed the sound effects. It was produced to right. be a play. Right, right. You know, so it was really interesting to watch that digression. Right. You know, I, I recently listened to um, a BBC4 presentation called Tommy's. And I think it's mm -hmm. got like six episodes, maybe five episodes. It's a World War One radio drama full cast full sound mm -hmm. effects and I, I love shows like that i know a lot of people like you said a lot of people complain in the audiobook fan club oh i don't want the sound effects i don't want all... and i and i agree that if you're doing a one person regular straight audiobook 
don't put the sound effects in. It's very distracting. But the way that Radio 4 does it, the way it sounds like you're going to try to do it, mm. it's more like a full-on movie. You just can't see the picture. Well, yeah, and there there are other examples. There's uh, a guy out of Maine named uh, William DeFries uh, who mm. puts things like this together. There's other people, um, the, the people behind Lock and Key, whose name escapes me at the moment. Right. Uh, L-O-C-K-E and Key. Right, right. Uh, that was a graphic novel which was turned into a full radio drama that's available in Audible, and that's actually doing very well. What's interesting is... Um, okay, so another serious theater reference. This one, not an acting one. This one, a design reference. Robert Edmund Jones. Mm. Um, basically, anyone who studies lighting set or sound design has to read that book sort of at the beginning of what they do. And he's got a quote that goes something like, um, let the scenery look like scenery, let the costumes look like costumes, and let the acting come from a place in the heart. Mm. And if I think about that when I do when I create a soundstage for an audio drama, what that means is it's not my job to fill every, every space. Right. It's my job to put in enough little pieces that indicate the scene so that you have the space as the listener to imagine the rest. A very crowded soundstage doesn't allow you, the listener, space to imagine. A sparse soundstage, maybe with, with, with just crunching leaves underfoot and maybe a light wind, lets you imagine the woods the person is walking through. I don't have to have every owl and every branch moving along the way. That's extra right. and gets right. in the way. Yeah, that actually reminds me, one of those episodes of Tommy's, if I remember correctly, started off with just the wheels of a cart squeaking, and you could hear like a, a can or something metal clanging on an off rhythm. And mm -hmm. it was, you know, and then the, the actors came in gradually whispering to each other and you got the impression automatically oh they're pulling a cart full of equipment at night and they're trying to be sneaky and then you could exactly. see the whole scene that was coming up very simple layout like you said and and the radio drama stuff is significantly different from a straight audio book right it's right. Uh, it, they're, they're two different beasts that feed into the same machine yeah, they feed into the same machine. They require the same actors. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, there's a, you know, they're, they require the same actors because they require an actor who can have a full on emotional response in an imagined space in the case where they can't see who they're acting with. Mm. When you're doing an audiobook, you're changing your perspective back and forth between the characters in an argument. When you're doing a radio play, you know, ideally, the two of you are in the same studio and you're using, let's say, a ribbon microphone so you can actually be face to face and that ribbon mic is picking up both actors on both sides and you can make eye contact and you can have that argument. Mm. That is incredibly expensive because that means let's get all the actors in one studio and get that done. The interesting part is trying to use new technology as it stands uh -huh. in order to be able to do what we're doing now just over Skype. You know, mm -hmm. to be able to have this thing where we can sit here and we can look at each other. You know, can we do it where we can look at each other? Maybe we shouldn't look at each other because the people listening to the story are only going to be able to use their ears. Basil, what if you and I can hear each other in real time, like on um, a conference call phone patch, but we couldn't see each other? Maybe we would do our acting slightly differently because we couldn't depend upon our eyes showing, I... you know, communicating that emotion. Maybe more of the emotion would actually be in the voice. And so there's some of this playing around to try to mm. figure out a way that we can do some sort of, for lack of a better idea, uh, phone conference, phone patch, right. and have everybody record locally and do their scene and then send all their audio to an engineer in order to make it all match up. Right, right. You know, so you can, you can sort of see where the logistical problem oh, yeah. is there. Yeah. yeah, I chatted a little bit with um, uh, Alex Hyde White last summer about uh, a project he did similar to that, uh, the uh, Black Sam. I can't remember the whole title, but mm -hmm. it was about the pirate Black Sam. And it was a similar deal. He had people recording dialogue in separate studios, sometimes not even, you know, they couldn't hear each other. They were just recording their parts, and then he was patching it together, and it sounded 
very complex. In the end, the story worked out pretty good, but it was right. a very complex way of doing things yeah, in my see, mind. Yeah, that, that method, doing sides, me sending you all of your lines and me having all of my lines and doing those lines in isolation, you know, is how a lot of fan or free audio drama is actually put together these days. Mm. Um, what, I, what I'd like to do is I'd like to somehow do the same work, but do the same work in a way where there is some connection between the actors. Because you've got, I've got to imagine that my delivery of my cue for your line is somehow going to affect your read. And then your response is going to change what I would do. So I've got to figure we come out with a better product if we can act together than if I send you three takes of every line and you try to piece together the ones that make it sound the best. Right. Right. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Well, that's, that's, that's very interesting. You've got a lot on your plate. It sounds like, and, 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 uh, I mean, between recording your own books and getting other people's stuff up there, doing the sound engineering stuff, it's, yeah. you, you've got a lot on your plate, and, but it's a good thing. You love your job. That's the key. Yeah, I, I do. I, I, I love this. Every every day I get to to realize this is what I chose to do. Um, it it's I feel blessed. Well, very good. Well, my my four roommates want to come up and ask you a couple of questions. You know, oh, okay. Leprechaun Brothers, Feely, yes. Neely, Boffin, and Bertold. And um, well, I'll just bring them in and let them do their thing. Oh, boys, boys, you ready? Yes, Mr. Basil, we'll come up right now. And uh, hold on just a second. Daily, come up. It's time to do the show. Oh, wait, well, let me finish this. Oh, you're not supposed to be drinking before you come up before the show. Oh, why not? Well, I guess we'll find out, won't we? Okay, come up here anyway. Let's do the show. Okay, boys, gather around. Here we go. Okay, ask Mr. Cohen your question. Uh, hello, Mr. Cohen. How are you doing today? Oh, I'm doing fine. How are you doing? Good. And that's not the only question we have for you, just so you know. You know, oh, some good. people, the first question you ask is the one that they assume is the main question. And then there's another question and they're all befuddled. So we don't want to befuddle you. Right? But, right. Okay. I get befuddled. Befuddled, I totally get. Excellent. Okay. My brothers get befuddled a lot. And then I slap them upside the head and they're unfuddled. Unfuddle yourself there, butter. Okay, here's the question for you for today. Now, uh, you go to the bathroom, which, you know, in America, they call it the bathroom, even though it may be a place that you're not intending to take a bath and would never want to take a bath. Where we're from, we just call it a toilet. And so you're, you're in the place that's the toilet or potentially the bathroom. And... You close the door, you do your thing, and then you go to open the door and you discover that the bathroom was actually a portal to another universe. Mm. You open the door and you walk out and you're in another universe altogether and there's a tall orange mannish looking thing and he wants to ask you a question but you don't understand the language and then he pulls out a long sharp object and you suddenly get really focused. Mm -hmm. What are you going to do in such a situation? Hmm. Um, uh, uh, I, I'm, I'm going to vamp. I'm going to start talking to him. I'm just going to keep talking and seeing if I can keep moving. And the more I move and the more I talk, maybe I can actually get myself back towards the door of the portal if the door of the portal hasn't closed yet. And I would just, I would kind of try to see if I can, you know, if I could keep myself talking and moving and, and get myself back where I was going, you know, because obviously, you know, sometimes things get a little timey-wimey and wibbly-wobbly. Very good okay. thing to do. Trying to escape to get back there. And then I would think. The, the tall the tall orangish man puts the sharp thing close to his mouth and starts what you can consider to be maybe singing. Hmm. Do you join him in his song? I think that would be the safe choice. I, I you know, I, I, I think that maybe I, I would try and see if I can find a, a, a harmony, you know, like something on a third and, and maybe I'd move next to the tall orange man and see if, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think that would be the, the wise move in that moment. That's excellent idea. Did you know, by the way, speaking of harmonizing, my brother Buffin, he can harmonize with the vacuum cleaner very well. Mm. It's kind of like that pentatonics group 
except mm -hmm. sucky, mm -hmm. like vacuum cleaner sucky. Yeah. That, that, that was a pun that I'll shut up now. So you start the singing, and then the big orangish guy offers you something that seems like he's offering you something to eat. Mm. Now you're in a dilemma because you know that some cultures, if you don't eat what they offer you, they may eat you. Yeah, there's that. There's also the some places where we're talking magical universes. If I eat, I may never be able to leave or it might be a hundred years later when I get back. Oh. You know, I mean, this could turn into that whole sort of um, Brigadoon kind of thing. There here, you go. You there know. you go. And then you become Stephen Cohen, Man of Mars. Yeah, probably. Or, or Prince I, I would of think. Galafalugalafugalugum. Can you say that again? Gal from that no. <laughs> There's a lot of places in the universe we can't pronounce more than one time. Yeah. But you know, the funny thing is there's a lot of places in Massachusetts I can't pronounce either. <laughs> so there's a great there's a great video about that. Oh really? Oh yes. Oh yes. And I promise I will I will send you guys a link to the video of people trying to pronounce town names in Massachusetts. Well, I know that I have a hard time with that. And even though, you know, in Ireland, there's places that people who speak normal English can't pronounce either, but at least we use all the letters. Yes, you know? yes. You, know, you guys do some strange things with letters. Well, I mean, this is when I get to say, look, I may live in Massachusetts now, but I was born in Brooklyn. So, it, you know, I, I don't take any responsibility for the fact that it's Worcester, not Worcester. Exactly. Uh, I, exactly, yeah. You know, because when you're in Brooklyn, you know, and, and you go into Manhattan, and there's a place called Wooster Street. Wooster is spelled W-O-O-S-T-E-R. Exactly. You know, exactly. It's, so Worcester is spelled the way it sounds when you're in, when, in New York City, not when you're here. It's like that sauce. You know, the, uh, the, uh, the what's his hair sauce. Exactly. I could never say that right. But, you know, life is what it is. So now that you've yeah. eaten the alien food and you're potentially mm. stuck in his galaxy. That's true. What will you try to teach this alien race? Hmm. And it could be things about humanity or that really exist or things that you wish existed about humanity. Hmm. With the knowledge that potentially that alien will step through the portal and end up where you left off. Ooh, okay. So, so do I understand the alien now or do I, do I still not understand the alien? Well, let's say that you ate his food and suddenly your eyes and ears was open and now, okay. like, oh, I get it. Right, because beforehand I was thinking, okay, maybe I'm spending the rest of my life as a mime, you know, because... Oh. I mean, if I'm not going to be able to communicate, I, I'm going to be doing things like this. Which they that's may really interpret as some kind of erotic dance, and then you'll find yourself in a very yeah. unpleasant situation. Yeah, that, that could be. That, that really could be. Uh, I don't know, guys. Um, you know, it's... I enjoy, you know, it's like from what, from what, everything we've been talking about, I mean, if, if, if I suddenly found myself in a place that alien and that different, all I could do is really kind of try to share with them who I am and see if there's any value there. If there's no value there, then I got to figure something else out. But if there is value there, probably the value there is stories. And if the value there is stories, because my world is so different from theirs, then I basically have a whole new group for me to sit around and tell stories to for, for, for as long as they'll listen. So that's like a guaranteed lifetime income because now you're I would think. guy. I would think. I would think I'm the new guy, and they've never, ever heard Mark Twain, and they've never, ever heard Philip K. Dick, and they've never heard any of these people, and I get to, like, recite these things as best I can from memory, because, of course, you know, I didn't I didn't take anything with me. You, you didn't say that I, like, right. had my cell phone or anything. Right. So. All you had was a piece of toilet paper stuck to your Yeah. Screen. Yeah, and, you know, and I, and I don't have a script written on there, so I've got to do these. I've got to improv for the rest of my life. That's it. Yeah. You'd be the hero. Oh. No. Uh, what would be the one thing that you'd miss the most about being back on modern day current earth? Oh boy. Talking to people like Basil. Oh Basil would be flattered. Basil, are you flattered? 
Well, no, I'm actually still quite round, but uh, I'd be flattered. Oh, well, okay. That's nice. And what if you had, uh, see, now you got to eat the orange man's alien food for the rest of your okay. life. What, what food would you miss the most? Oh, pizza, probably. Oh, that would be. A I'm going to guess. Yeah. You could introduce pizza to them. I could. And turn it into your own food network show for Alien oh. Food Network. You'd call there it you Food Gloob Network. Yeah, that's probably what mm -hmm. they call a Gloob Network. Mm -hmm. I like it. And you could have like pizza with tiny little alien fishes on it or, or little octopi kind of things. So, 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 you, so you're an anchovies guy? Well, my brother is. Oh, okay. I'm more like a... You ever, you know, the Korean people eat the live octopuses. You ever seen mm -hmm. that? The squiggling but not around. On pizza. Yeah, my my brother likes that. I don't like that. Oh, I'm okay. a straight up pepperoni, olives, sausage, and occasionally, you know, like spinach and feta cheese kind of guy. Hmm. I like that pizza. Oh yeah, it's good stuff. Yeah. Azel had one like that in New York when he was there last time. You people, your your New Yorkish people there in Manhattan, they had some good pizza flavors. Well, Basil is going to get to try Chicago pizza next. And he said he's looking forward to it, aren't you, Basil? I am very much looking forward to it. That's, that's my comparison. My comparisons of, of big cities is the pizza. And then if I go to a Mexican restaurant, I like to try the chili rellenos in every Mexican mm. restaurant I go to. Those are the two things by which I gauge society. Basil has a very limited range of society gauging tools. So, but it works for him, I think. Well, I think I that's think about so, all too. the questions we have for you, Mr. Stephen J. Cohen. My brothers, do you guys have any other questions? I have a question for you. When Basil okay. buys you a drink in Chicago, what kind of drink do you want him to buy you? I have no idea. I'm going to have to like see what kind of a mood Basil is in. Hey, you know what? I've actually got a question for you guys. Okay, go for it. We like well, questions. Well, you know, you know, you guys have been really specific about using my whole name, which includes my middle name. And yes. I'm wondering, do you guys have middle names? Well, we did at one point in time. <laughs> and, well, see, our first, our names are in the order of age. I'm Feely. I'm the oldest. Mm -hmm. This is Neely. He's my second brother. This is Boffin. He's my third brother. Not that he's a third, although sometimes he acts like a third. And this mm -hmm. is Bertold. He's our youngest brother by fall. He's like 100 years old or younger than the rest of us. And so all of us in, in our culture, in the leprechaun culture, it's a little different than the regular human people culture, both in Ireland and in here in America. You're called by a feature of yourself. For mm -hmm. instance, I am Feely the Red because my hair is red and my beard is red. And my brother, Neely, he's Neely the Big because he's about three inches taller than the rest of us which, you know, he's still under four feet tall, but he's kind of big for us, for leprechauns. And then Boffin, well, he's just called Boffin. His name was originally Keeley, but, uh, well, we called him Keeley, and then uh, my brother Neely accidentally hit him really hard on the head when he was acting like a dork one day, and it knocked him out. And since we buffed him on the head, and he was knocked out, and then he mm -hmm. came back, we called him Boffin. So he's, uh, I guess you could say he's... Keely the Buffin. And Berthold, well, he doesn't grow a beard. And he's the only one of us, even in our whole clan, who doesn't have a mm. beard. So he's called Berthold Smoothface. Oh, I was thinking Berthold the Beardless. Well, that was taken by our sister. Mm. Okay. So, and, and, and she's one of the few too, would you believe it? So, yeah, we don't really have middle names. We have descriptor, descriptor. Descriptor. There's called descriptor names. We have descriptor names. Okay. Which is not the same as destructor names, which no. is like that guy with the skull head on He-Man from way mm -hmm. back when. That was that was our favorite cartoon. He-Man. And I, that's all I remember from it. <laughs> but, yeah, does that answer your question, sir? Uh, that does answer my question. Good. I'm very happy to answer questions as well as ask them. Not too many people ask us questions except, hey, leprechaun, where's your gold? To which we say, dude, if we had gold, do you think we'd be living in Basil's basement? And they don't believe yeah. us and we have to run away anyway. Yeah, well, people will do that. Yes, that's a fact. 
Yeah. Well, speaking of that, we got to go back down and we're finishing up some projects with Gerald the Troll and we left Gerald in charge of some very fine woodwork in China and we have to make sure that right. it's still in one piece because Gerald gets carried away sometimes. Yeah, I, I hear that leaving Gerald in charge of things can uh, lead to very interesting results. Sometimes so. So yeah. very much so. But he's remarkably good at making dainty things. Like, would you believe he can crochet like there's no end to the day? Not bad for a nine-foot-tall troll. No, not bad at all. With a limited education to boot. Oh, yeah, very mm. But anyway, we got to go see him. So thank you very much, Mr. Stephen J. Cohen, for taking time to be with us on the show and letting us ask you silly questions. Okay. Have a very wonderful rest of your winter. See you, you at too. Enjoy. All right, boys. Thank you very much for coming up. Enjoy your trip back down. Thank you, Mr. Basil. We'll see you later. Sorry about the mess. We'll try to get it cleaned up before you get out of the booth. What mess? Uh, never mind. Okay, so, anyway, looks like I got my work cut out when I get out of here. Uh, thank you very much for being on the show with us, Stephen. It's been great chatting with you. Wonderful insights into the business, into the industry. And, uh... Yeah, I think I'll take you up on that Edgar Allan Poe challenge there. Yeah, you know, it's like wh whether it's Poe or the other, we were talking about Washington Irving with... Uh, oh, oh with, yeah, oh yeah. 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 The, uh, yeah. Yeah, the Sleepy Hollow, yeah. I really yeah. think, yeah. I mean, just go back and take a look through that. And, and if you wind up with time, I think it would be really fun to be able to put that out for Halloween. Yeah. I think yeah. I can make time between now and then enough oh, yeah. to get it out of production. So, cool. Well, thank you very much, and uh, I'll see you at APAC. Sounds great. Oh, shoot, I forgot to ask him if he was a king. He did kind of look like a king sitting on his throne in a padded room. Well, a king of sorts, maybe. A king in his own domain? Yeah, that's what we'll call it. He is the king of his own domain. I wonder how that word domain got its name. Because it sounds almost like, you know, while domain sounds like a place where kings are and stuff, it sounds also like maybe it was like from a bakery shop or something. Bakery shop? What are you talking about, bakery shop? You know, like a bakery shop. Because they got dough, and it's on Main Street. So, domain. Domain Refisalotido. You're very strange, little brother. This show is copyright 2016 by Basil Sands and Sandman Production Studios. We appear in Alaska, where my brother thinks he's going to be on The Sound of Music or something like that. The hills are alive with the sound. Ow, what you hit me for? Just stop singing. <laughs>